So thank you, Joe, for the introduction, and well, thanks to the organizer for inviting me here. It's nice to be back home. <laughs> Uh, my presentation today um, is entitled The Fiscal Compact, The Golden Rule, and the Paradox of European Federalism, and its aim is to provide some comparative insights, so to say, on the uh, discussion we're having about the constitutional future of the European Economic and uh, Monetary Union. And more specifically, the purpose of my paper is to analyze the central provision of the Fiscal Compact Treaty, the so-called golden rule, that is the requirement for member states to run their balance in budget, uh, to survey its uh, incorporation in the constitution of four selective member states, and to examine what are the institutional implications of this golden rule on the vertical balance of powers between the member states and the European Union in a comparative perspective with the United States of America. The argument that I'll try to bring forward today is that actually the golden rule, uh, it's going to produce an unprecedented phenomenon of centralization in lawmaking in the European Union. And actually what I will claim is that uh, this centralization is much stronger in the EU than in the United States because the United States is a federal system. So what I will uh, try to argue is that really Europe uh, is heading into a paradoxical situation by avoiding uh, the federal question uh, is actually bringing about a system which is much more centralizing and restrictive of state autonomy uh, than uh, would be permitted under a federal system of government. And to do so, I will proceed in four steps. So I will first briefly uh, mention the central uh, clause of the Fiscal Compact Treaty, uh, the golden rule, as I said, and then uh, go and look at a little bit how this rule has been, uh, on the one hand, uh, drawn from German constitutional law and then uh, copied into uh, the constitutions of uh, Spain and Italy and to some extent also France. I'll then look at the institutional implication of the golden rule and conclude with uh, some comparative remarks where I try to uh, um, argue more in detail uh, why I think the fiscal compact is producing a paradoxical situation in the uh, EU federal system of, of government. So uh, let me get started very briefly, of course, on the first point, uh, since you are all extremely learned about the context uh, that uh, bring, uh, brought about the, the fiscal compact treaty with the euro crisis. I'll just want to mention that, of course, uh, one of the core understanding of the reasons of the crisis was profligate fiscal policies by the states. And so because of that, of course, the response was strengthen budgetary constraints at the state level. And this is precisely what the Fiscal Compact does. Article 3, uh, which I won't read because it's a sunny day outside and I don't want to make this day, this wonderful day all of a sudden become awful, but it's, it's a very long and technical uh, provision, but essentially it has four, um, um, uh, four substantive elements. First of all, it details a very specific balanced budget rule. As you know, there is an obligation for, uh, for, for states to run their structural balance with a maximum deficit of 0.5% of, of the GDP. Uh, the, the clause goes into, uh, in, into de technical details about how these rules should comply with the medium term objective that every state has when there are uh, exceptions that uh, due to natural disasters, for example, allow states to de deviate from the rule, et cetera, et cetera. So in any case, the central point is that the treaty really goes into uh, uh, extreme, uh, extremely detailed economic issues in uh, uh, um, forcing the states to adopt a balanced budget obligation. Now, so far, nothing new. After all, European legislation is always very technical, and we all know that, but then comes in another important and rather innovative provision, which is the second paragraph of Article 3, which requires the state to adopt this golden rule at the state constitutional level. This rule has been a little bit watered down over the, the last weeks of, of treaty drafting uh, because of countries like the one where I live now, in the Netherlands, where changing the constitution is uh, almost impossible, and because of that, there is now the permission to adopt this rule with means that are equivalent, so to say, to our constitutional revisions, but not as burdensome as a constitutional revision. But it's important to get the point that uh, the, the fiscal compact requires states 
to go back home and do within their legal systems important constitutional changes. And then comes a third element, uh, which is Article 8, which provides a judicial backup for this incorporation of the Golden Rule at the state level. So the, the European Court of Justice can be sued, uh, or better, a country that does not incorporate the rule can be sued before the European Court of Justice, and the Court of Justice, therefore, gets the power to review how member states change their constitution. Now, again, European lawyers will know that it's not uh, 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 unusual for the Court of Justice to review constitutional provision of the state. Uh, the, the Tanya Kreil case, I see many Germans in the room, so let me mention it now. The Tanya Kreil case, it's, it's a paradigmatic example of how the Court of Justice can require states to change the constitution, but the, the qualitative change that we are facing here is that the Court of Justice gets really to police and supervise how member states are changing their fundamental laws. And last but not link, uh, last but not least, it's uh, a fine of the golden rule, uh, which actually comes out of the uh, a recital of the preamble of the Fiscal Compact Treaty, which links the adoption of the golden rule to the possibility to exceed the supports of the ESM uh, uh, financial shield. So states which do not adopt a balanced budget amendment in their state constitutions will not be able to benefit of the founding from the ESM. Now, uh, how, how did the Golden Rule came about and how has it been uh, adopted in several member states? Let me first briefly mention, uh, from a methodological point of view, why I picked these four countries, Germany, Spain, uh, France, and Italy. And the reasons are uh, both pragmatic and uh, institutional. The pragmatic reason is that these four countries together amount to uh, 40, more than 75% of the GDP of the Eurozone. So looking at how the Golden Rule is adopted in this country has uh, some practical impact uh, on the assumption that, as I, I was always saying previously, uh, the Golden Rule really tries to tackle problems within uh, the Eurozone. But then there is also another reason in choosing these countries, and it has to do with the uh, different institutional setups of these four regimes, both in terms of form of government and systems of constitutional review. So, of course, France is a semi presidential systems, whereas Germany, Spain, and Italy are parliamentary systems, but with huge uh, difference between one and the others. And from the point of view of, of constitutional reviews, they all have centralized constitutional courts, but the ways and mechanisms by which uh, constitutional courts can be activated differ from one country to the other. And this variation in institutional systems will become relevant as I move uh, into the next slide in looking at how the, the golden rule affects the internal setups of the states by having variations uh, for, for uh, uh, country studies with, with different features, uh, I will be able to uh, draw some more general conclusions on the implication of the rule. Um, I don't want to enter now into details, of course, if uh, anyone is interested in the Q&A, I can try to answer uh, your question, but what I want to underline now is that in looking at the four major economies of the Eurozone, we see a consistent trend toward the adoption of a golden rule. Germany, of course, was a front runner uh, with the Federalismus reform in, in 2009, and Article 3 of the Fiscal Compact, to a large extent, uh, copies Article 115 of the Grundgesetz. And uh, on the model of Germany, Spain modified its constitution, Italy did the same, France under President Sarkozy was about to do it. Uh, uh, the victory of Hollande uh, halted the process of constitutional reform, and in fact now France has decided to ratify the, the fiscal compact and its core, incorporate its core provision through a loi organique. So France is actually the only uh, major country uh, with, without a constitutional uh, balanced budget requirement at the moment. But with that exception, there is a consistent trend toward incorporation. So now, what are the implications of of this, uh, of this incorporation of the Golden Rule within the states and in the relationship between the states and the European Union. At the internal constitutional level, what my uh, research uh, uh, highlights is that actually there is major variations between countries to countries. And these differences are largely dependent on pre-existing uh, institutional set setup within every member state. So for example, the effect of the golden rule on the relationship between parliaments and executives 
are likely to depend from uh, the respective powers that governments and legislatures have within the constitutional systems. In countries like France, where the executive is in full control of the budgetary process, the existence of a golden rule is not going to shift power from one to the other, but in countries like my own, Italy, for example, where uh, the, the, the result, the, the, the bud budgets are often the result of bargaining between parliamentary leaders, the existence of a clear constitutional requirements on a balanced budget is probably going to shift power toward the executive in making it more, uh, uh, more uh, able to pass through parliament its budget draft. And the same, I think, it's true with regards to constitutional courts. I'm obviously interested in, in looking at the constitutional court because the constitutionalization of a balanced budget means that uh, that provision will become enforceable. Uh, you know, when you have a system of constitutional review, what courts do is exactly to look whether statutes are compatible with the constitution. But there again, uh, is the institutional difference within the member states will have uh, uh, will produce variation across the board. So in countries where constitutional courts can be, uh, for example, activated a priori before the entry into force of a law, uh, clearly the existence of a balanced budget requirement in the constitutions makes the makes constitutional court able to uh, effectively exercise review. In countries where instead constitutional courts can only be activated ex post uh, through referral of regions or uh, preliminary reference by judges, it's much harder to expect courts to get involved into the policing of, of a balanced budget obligation. I mean, it would be uh, rather bizarre uh, to have a court in 2020, uh, 2020 uh, striking down a budget adopted in 2015. Uh, no one would imagine what the effect could be. So in general, let me just say that the, the implications of a balanced budget requirement at the state constitutional level are likely to be asymmetric. They will change from one state to the other depending on pre-existing institutional system. What in my view instead is going to be a symmetric effect of the golden rule is a shift of power toward the center, toward Brussels, so to say, in the relationship between the states and the European Union. Now, I already mentioned previously the role that the European Court of Justice uh, acquires under the fiscal compact to supervise uh, national constitutional revision process. But of course, another big winner of uh, all these institutional reforms at the European level is the Commission. It was mentioned yesterday a number of times in the, uh, in the planners and the panels uh, that especially if we consider the fiscal compact within the broader context of uh, the two pack, the six pack, the European semester, the, Euro the European Commission acquires unprecedented powers to dictate, overview, police, reverse the budgetary process of the member states. And this centralizing effect, uh, uh, I think, is, is strengthened by the existence of, of a golden rule that sets clear standards also for the European Commission. The strengthening of centralized of, uh, supranational institutions has one exception, however, uh, which was also mentioned a number of times yesterday, and it's the European Parliament which does not gain any new power, and I think this is a problematic uh, development. But with the exception of the parliament, I would say European institutions are uh, acquiring um, unprecedented uh, roles in setting budgetary pol uh, policies of the states. Now, how does this fares if we compare it to the United States system? Uh, the US system, it's, I think, particularly interesting because it shows a number of similarities and a number of differences with uh, the European model. Uh, those of you who have taken the pain to, to read the papers uh, will have noticed that the part on the United States is, is rather short in my paper, and the reason is that uh, the paper was written for an American audience, so I knew they would know what fiscal federalism uh, is in the United States, but uh, since maybe the audience today is it's, it's not that uh, familiar with the US system, let me just go a little bit more in detail on, on uh, the American model of fiscal federalism. Well, the US system is interesting because it's essentially based on uh, assumptions which are analogous to those of the European Economic and Monetary Union. So the federal government operates under a rule which is the equivalent of Article 125 of the Treaty on the Function of the Union, the no bailout clause. 
And this is not written in the text of the Constitution, but since the 1830s, it's a clear uh, constitutional convention of the American government. So if the state of Illinois fails, the federal government will not bail it out. Now, because of that, the states of the Union have adopted balanced budget. Starting precisely in the 1830s, there was a major economic crisis. States had started building railroads, canals, because America was expanding westwards, and not all the debts were, uh, were that good. They weren't able to pay it off, uh, and they failed. And the federal governments did not bail them out. And what happened is that states started adopting balanced budget obligation in their constitution. So today, 35 states out of 50 have constitutional requirements, and if, we, if you consider other uh, balanced budget requirements not in the state's constitution, but so to say in equivalent constitutional sources, 49 out of 50 have obligations similar to a golden rule in their legal system. Now, this is as much as the similarities are concerned. What about the difference? Well, the central point is that states adopted balanced budget obligation in their system autonomously. The federal government never required them to do so. In fact, actually, under a federal system of government like the United States, the federal government is prohibited from requiring states to change their constitution. And even today, although, as you all know, since the, the New Deal and, uh, well, during the last, the, the 20th century, the federal government has largely expanded its capacity to govern the economy with the establishment of a Federal Reserve Bank, the enlargement of the federal budget, the introduction of new federal programs, uh, especially from the New Deal onwards, about the Great Society as well. But the core principle is that the budgetary process of the states and the budgetary process of the federal government remain strictly separate. The state of California does not need to submit its budget to Washington, D.C. and get it approved before being able to ratify it at the state level. One of the core doctrine of U.S. constitutional law is called the anti-commandeering doctrine, and the Supreme Court is quite strict in enforcing it, requires that uh, the, um, the uh, prohibits the federal government from obliging the states to adopt specific legislation or specific constitutional amendment. So the federal government does not have any effective legal, duty, legal possibility to force the states to adopt an obligation like the balanced budget rule. And this is, I believe, a very significant difference uh, from, from Europe and a difference that I like what I call the paradox of the EU system. The uh, Euro crisis and the responses to it have, have been driving, driven by, uh, if you look at the narrative, a desire to preserve the sovereignty of the states. Former President Sarkozy was, is obviously here a case in point in his uh, famous speech in Toulon where he said we will do a fiscal compact and we will adopt a reforms of the European, uh, the architecture of the EMU, but preserve the sovereignty of the states. But if you actually scratch this narrative and you go and look at the substance, what emerges is that the intentions of preserving state autonomy and the outcome of it are diametrically opposed. So state autonomy is in fact much more undermined under the uh, fiscal compact rules than it would have been under a federal system of government like the United States. And of course, there were important voices uh, uh, calling for a federal change in the architecture of the EMU, but these were discarded on the assumption that it would be too centralizing. Well, what I'm trying to show you today is that, in fact, they are more centralizing than what federalism would uh, permit. And I think it's interesting uh, to consider that the word uh, fiscal compact, which is the, 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 the conventional name for the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance in Economic and Monetary Union, was, uh, um, was used by uh, President Mario Draghi of the ECB in a speech before the European Parliament. And in using this expression, he was taking inspiration from a famous sentence by Alexander Hamilton, who spoke of a voluntary compact between the rulers and the ruled for the establishment of civil government. Well, Alexander Hamilton was one of the founding fathers of the US federal system and one of its main architect of a federal constitutional arrangement for the United States. So uh, maybe we should uh, go back to his uh, writing and thoughts uh, in, as we think anew about the constitutional future of the Economic and Monetary Union. Thank you. Thank you.